Welcome back to my channel. So good evening, everyone. So today in Bursting the Myths 4. So I'm going to discuss a very important topic. So uh, I'm sure all of you must have uh, seen various cases of this. And the picture should have given you a clue to regarding the topic which I'll be discussing today. So today again, uh, I'll be discussing about candidemia. So let's get started without any further ado. And uh, in the end of the at the end of this presentation, I have a contest which I'm going to announce. So stay tuned. So let's talk Candida today. So what are these Candida? The Candida species are a part of normal uh, human microbiota. They uh, come under the family of your bees. Uh, so whenever you're seeing in a culture report saying budding yeast cells, so we are more likely to be Candida. Apart from that, there could be even Cryptococcus, but uh, uh, and these infections, are usually due to the um, when uh, they usually colonize the gastrointestinal tract and genitourinary tract and the skin as well. So the infections are more likely to result once uh, there is a breach in these. So the common species of Canada include your Canada albicans, Canada glabrata, Canada parapsilosis, Canada tropicalis, Canada cruci, and the new emerging one of concern is Canada oris. So knowing the species is also important because. Uh, the treatment regimen can change. Like your Candida cruci is resistant to your fluconazole and Candida glabrata has higher resistance to your fluconazole. So, uh, and as well as your Candida parapsilosis. That is why it is very necessary that you know the species of Candida as well. And Candida aureus is known to be multi-drug resistant. So in that, especially you will be requiring all your AFST report as well. So how does this infection spread? So as I mentioned, the, uh, the Canada usually colonizes your gut. So whenever there's a breach, um, like perforation or peritonitis, so there could be over for the the Canada can emerge out of the usual uh, colonizing space, and then other to the way the, uh, the blood vessel where it can undergo colonization first, and this half there will be further. Uh, multiplication and hyper spread and inf in, uh, invasion happens and then it reaches into your blood and this can also happen uh, very commonly due to the insertion of cvc the central venous catheter so your the carrier which were colonizing over your skin now can engage an easy entry into the bloodstream causing the condition known as candidemia now this candidemia uh, through this through the blood it can spread to various tissues like your bone abdominal cavity, the brain causing brain abscesses, eye causing choroiditis, uh, to the heart causing endocarditis, kidney, pyelonephritis, uh, renal abscesses, etc., liver and spleen causing chronic disseminated candidiasis, etc. So that is why it is very important that uh, you understand this. I'm taking the guidelines for uh, clinical, clinical practice guidelines for management of candidiasis uh, given by the IDSA in 2016. And uh, the ECMED guidelines for management of candidiasis 2012 by non-eutropenic adults. So, first, one of the most common scenario which is faced is Canada grown in respiratory specimen. Should you treat this? No. The growth of Canada from respiratory secretion usually indicates colonization and does not require treatment with an antifungal. So, if you have a sputum sample, bar sample, etc., showing. Candida, it is a part of normal commensal flora. You have to just mention the same thing in your report and, uh, and this should not be routinely treated. So next common situation you will come across is Candida in urine. Should I treat? So again, depends whether the patient is having symptoms or not. If it is an asymptomatic candiduria, like the patient has been chronically catheterized, is having no symptoms at all, then there is no requirement to treat. You should not use an antifungal to treat the asymptomatic candiduria. Even however high the count is, 10 power 3, 10 power 4, 10 power 5, you shouldn't be treating this. And it should be treated when even asymptomatic candiduria, only in certain situation you'll be treating. When is, if the patient is neutropenic and very low birth weight infants, less than 1.5 uh, kgs, and the patients who will undergo neurologic manipulation. So these are the only patients you will be treating asymptomatic candiduria. Otherwise, routinely you shouldn't be treating asymptomatic candiduria. 
and whenever possible you should eliminate the predisposing factors like indwelling uh, bladder catheters and the next situation is the patient is symptomatic so should i treat in that situation so symptomatic candida cystitis in that situation you will be treating it with fluconazole if it is a fluconazole susceptible organism that is oral fluconazole at a dose of 200 mg for 2 weeks and if it is fluconazole resistant or it could be candida cruzi where you fluconazole it is intrinsically resistant so you that time you can use amphotericin b uh, the dose of 0.3 to 0.6 mg and you can depend 1 to 7 days is the duration and whenever uh, recommended you should be uh, trying to remove the involving bladder catheter if it is feasible so next very important and uh, cause of high mortality up to 70% is the cases of candidemia so any candida which is growing in the blood culture even if it is a single bottle should not be considered as a contaminant and hence you should always and always look for the source uh, or whether meta, uh, or any other metastatic foci that is why it is recommended that you do echocardiogram in any patient who is having candidemia and once it is isolated you will have to repeat the culture every alternate day at least until the clearance is documented and all the intravascular catheter should be removed whenever possible and uh, all these patients of candidemia should undergo should and should undergo dilated fundoscopy examination within the first week after in, during the initiation of the therapy this is to rule out end of thymitis and other secondary sequelae or the like chorioretinitis choroiditis etc due to candidemia and if the your patient is neutropenic patient you can repeat the ophthalmoscopic examination once the neutropenia has resolved so the important takeaway points from this slide is you all never consider candida as a contaminant and all in blood in blood this is candidemia patients and always and always you have to do echocardiogram remove the catheters and do the dilated uh, fundoscopic examination what is the so your uh, uh, the microbiology lab issues an alert uh, say a uh, budding yeast cell growth in blood culture and whenever you are seeing blood, budding yeast cell you should always ask whether it is with pseudo hyphae or without pseudo hyphae so without pseudo hyphae you will be thinking more in terms of it could be candida glabrata as well as candida oris which are more resistant to your caspopor um to your uh, usual fluconazole and also important thing is as soon as the report uh, is given you should start the patient on an antifungal what is the antifungal of choice so the empiric treatment is echinocandin so caspofungin is the drug of choice you will be starting empirically even if when a patient is having candidemia so the caspofungin the loading dose of 70 mg uh, irrespective of the body weight 70 mg for well, first day followed by 50 mg daily thereafter and how long are you going to treat this patient so uh, if the patient is not having so you do uh, once the candidemia is uh, uh, detected you will start the patient on caspofungin empirically then based on uh, that we will be doing the dilated fundoscopy as well as endoscopy uh, echocardiogram to look for the other metastatic foci if there are no metastatic foci and no other complications and you should be sending alternate blood culture so 14 days following the negative blood culture is what you are going to give the overall duration is going to be be based on when you get your negative or a sterile uh, blood culture so after the, the blood has got sterilized you have to treat for 14 days more and in case of neutropenic patient 14 days after first negative and when the neutropenia has resolved so also a very one important of, uh, part is the de escalation so you have started empirically on the caspo uh, caspo fungin that is an echinocandid so once you get the uh, if uh, the candida species identification and your afst you are going to de escalate the patient to fluconazole when the patient is clinically stable or uh, repeat and the repeat culture is uh, negative so the fluconazole dose you are going to use is 800 mg first day followed by 400 m mg iv daily and the species on blood culture 
then uh, you are going to speciate and we are going to find the species. So depending upon the type of species. So initial therapy is going to be same. That is echinocandine for all the patients. So once the patient is stabilized, you, have, you are going to step down. So the step down depends upon the species and the sensitivity. So if it is Canada albitins, uh, you can uh, you find if it is a sensitive strain, you can continue. You can step down to fluconazole instead of continuing the caspofungin. If uh, in cases of Clanida glabrata, so uh, you will be stepping down to uh, either voriconazole or a high dose fluconazole. That is here you will be giving at the dose of 800 mg. In cases of Candida cruzi, which is resistant to your um, fluconazole, you can uh, step down to voriconazole. In case of Candida auris, again depending upon the susceptibility pattern, you can use the oral step down. So next. Candida infective endocarditis. So in cases of infective endocarditis, the drug of choice is your lipoto, liposomal amphotericin B with or without flucytosis. So it is for six to eight weeks and followed uh, followed by you can give fluconazole. And in cases of native uh, valve endocarditis, surgery is recommended within a week. In cases of prosthetic valve candida endocarditis, uh, so immediately you will have to do the surgery. If it is not removed, you have to give lifelong fluconazole prophylaxis and whenever there is a device like pacemaker or intracardiac device or uh, ventilator associated devices all of this should be removed so the dictum in cases of candidemia is just like your mrsa you will have to remove the source of infection so uh, the source control is very very necessary that is why wherever possible uh, the surgery should be done to uh, in case of native valve remove the prosthetic valve and then Remove any pacemaker or ICG or VAD removal is a must. And the drug of choice, so initially you have started caspofungin and uh, you have done the 2D echo. Now you are finding infective endocarditis, uh, either vegetation or something. So then based on that, you have to change the therapy to liposomal amphotericin with or without flu cytosin. Now let's talk about the drug. So the caspofungin is nothing but an echinocandin and uh, it is uh, it, has, it has no action against cryptococcus and triposporon uh, and it achieves less concentration in CSF and urine. So the dose I have mentioned 70 mg IV loading dose followed by 50 mg IV and it is a concentration over uh, uh, like both concentration and time dependent kinetics that is AUC by MIC and it doesn't require any renal modification and hepatic modification also only in cases of moderate insufficiency and there is insufficient uh, uh, interaction between rifampicin, uh, I mean caspofungin with rifampicin as well as tacrolimus and cyclosporin. So with rifampicin, the dose of, uh, you'll have to add an additional dose of caspofungin instead of uh, uh, continuation dose of 50 mg, you may have to give 70 mg. So, because it has less concentration in CSF and urine, you are not going to uh, better not, not to be used in cases of meningitis, endocarditis, as well as endophthalmitis. So this is a uh, very good flow chart. So how are you going to approach? So whenever the patient is having high risk for invasive candidiasis, so what are the care, what are the uh, like uh, high risk uh, indications or uh, risk factors associated with invasive candidiasis. So most of you will know the patients who are on uh, multiple antibiotics for long duration, then uh, your uh, CVC, presence of CVC patients on, uh, with abdominal surgery, uh, with uh, total parental nutrition and so on. So next you're going to, based on that, you're going to predict the candida score. So what is candida score? So candida score, I'll be discussing in the next slide. So based on the, if the Canada score is more than three, you have to do the uh, any of the biomarkers uh, and um, like uh, beta D glucan or PCR, etc. Once the Canada score is more than three and it is a, there is a positive biomarker, better to initiate the antifungal uh, treatment along with the so adequate source control like surgical debridement, CVC extraction, and you will obviously have to send for blood culture, your CRP, PCT, etc. And then based on whether the patient has been exposed to echinocandine in the previous, so most of your uh, uh, neutropenic patients, like your 
solid organ transplant they may already be on profile access so if there is no recent exposure you can consider con uh, giving a kind of candidate if there is more uh, exposure you can consider liposomal amputation b now then based on the uh, culture report like i have showed you can modify the therapy so what is this canada score so canada score is nothing but a score uh, of uh, uh, given for presence of these risk factors like total parental nutrition surgery uh, surgery multifocal candida colonization and severe sepsis so all of them will have score of 1 except for severe sepsis uh, two points so if the score is more than 3 there uh, it has 81% uh, sensitive and 74% specific for diagnosis of invasive candidiasis it has uh, uh seven point so when the score is more than 3 there is 7.7 fold time the greater increase in risk of candidiasis and this is a very easy bedside scoring system which can use which has a very high negative predictive value of up to 80 to 97% and positive predictive value of 50 to 70 uh, 60 to 70% so apart from canada score so as i you can see uh it has a uh an pp of 57% and npo of 97% so that is a preferred scoring system which we use apart from that we have other scoring systems as well so one is the canada colonization index and corrected canada colonization index where you are going to uh like uh, basically that is nothing but the number of uh, cultures growing canada divided by number of cultures sent that is our uh, canada colonization index so that has a, a poor uh, true positive predictive value and with a okay uh, negative predictive value then uh, there is one more scoring system ostrowski uh, zickner uh, scoring system so patients who are already on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics for more than 3 to 5 days with a cvc in place for uh, um, Uh, for more than two, uh, three to five days, with more than equal to two uh, for risk factors like TP and hemodialysis, pancreatitis, or on corticosteroid or immunosuppression, uh, it has a negative predictive value of ninety nine percent, with a poor, very poor PPV of four point two percent. Then there is one more scoring system called the Nebraska Medical Score, which has uh, total parental nutrition, CVC, broad spectrum antibiotics, steroids, and abdominal surgery. which again has a very good negative predictive value with a limit, very low positive predictive value so why am i stressing so negative pre uh, predictive value will almost exclude so if it is having a very good negative predictive value if the score is not significant you can it almost excludes your invasive candidiasis so this can be used as a uh, uh, and this scoring system is not uh, overruling your clinical uh, suspicion so uh you can use the scoring system for uh, using it as a guide to in which patients you need to send for your biomarkers cultures are compulsory so biomarkers because cultures take little extra time and biomarkers you can get it early report so you can use this scoring system to se selectively select the patient whom you need to do the biomarkers so that you will have no difficulty in interpretation so what are these biomarkers i'm speaking about so when it comes to invasive candidiasis i'm talking about the beta d glucan which is the most widely used marker for biomarker for detection or uh, identification of invasive candidiasis so it is nothing but uh, so 1 3 beta d glucan is nothing but a polysaccharide which is predominant and specific constituent of the cell wall but it is present in most of the fungi so this is an advantage as well as a disadvantage because it is not specific only for your candida and uh, this can be used as a biomarker for both invasive aspergillosis as well as candidiasis and it is negative so negative um, uh, beta d glucan is seen in cases of mucarens and your cryptococcus species and uh, there is an increasing role of use of beta d glucan in pcp as well so you can even use in pcp it's uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, currently validated only in the serum sample the conventional cut off is 80 so there are so if you do in any patient in icu uh, because of the uh, uh, like various cross reactivity you can get varied reports like 150 in patients who are not 
having risk for invasive candidiasis. That is why you have to use the adequately the scoring system, then the positive beta D glucan, especially in Indian scenarios, there is supposed to be this uh, conventional cutoff of 80 is a uh, very, uh, very, uh, it has a very less uh, usefulness because many patients will have little higher scores. So, it is uh, so you can use beta D glucan but easily for negative, uh, like ruling out candida. So, those patients who are having less than 80 or uh, less than 60, actually, less than 60, you can as well rule out invasive candidiasis and stop the uh, use of antifungal. So, in cases of in the Indian situation, so it is better to use a higher cutoff of around 150 to more than 150 at least, so that you are avoiding over treatment of invasive candidiasis. So, this is a very uh, good tab table for uh, as a role of beta D glucan for diagnosis of invasive fungal infection in adults. This was published in SIDS in 2021. So, in Depending upon the type of pop patient population, they have recommended whether it can be used or not. So, in hematological cancer uh, patients uh, for diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis candidiasis and other uh, invasive fungal infection, uh, uh, beta D glucan to exclude IFI is not recommended because of low NPV. Whereas in cases for uh, if it is positive. Based if uh, and along with two, cons uh, if it is positive, we'll have to repeat the test. And if two consecutive to positive tests are you uh, are there, then you can consider treating. In case of solid organ transplant, uh, if the pre uh, you can use it to exclude IFI uh, if the pre-test probability is low. And it is not recommended that you use beta D glucan positivity for uh, treatment uh, for deciding the tree whether you want to treat the invasive candidiasis or not. In cases of other types of immunosuppression, uh, it is not recommended to use beta D glucan to guide for uh, treating the cases as IFI, but you can still use to exclude the IFI. In cases of in ICU situation, uh, critical uh, patients. So, in case for invasive candidiasis, uh, if the pretest uh, probability is low, you can still use that to uh, low, uh, that is pretest probability is nothing but what you are going getting it by the scoring system. If it is low, you can use this to exclude. If it is, if uh, the testing is restricted to high risk patients, you can use. Uh, it as a guide to start the treatment if two consecutive, uh, two consecutive uh, samples are positive for in serum beta D glucan. Next, if for invasive aspergillosis, as I mentioned in my previous webinar, uh, it is not recommended to use beta D glucan as a marker. You will have to go with galactomannan. So, how are you going to use? So, for any critical patient, you do the uh, various uh, Canada colonization studies or you you can send various cultures for or you can look at the Canada score. So if the Canada score is less than three, do not initiate an antifungal therapy. If it is more than three, you can start the antifungal therapy and simultaneously send the 1-3 beta D glucan. And if it is negative, you should be stopping. If it is positive, you can use the antifungal. Next. So this is a very important diagram. So again, as we all know, uh, there is prophylaxis, preemptive. So, what is prophylaxis? So, prophylaxis is nothing but uh, when you are treating uh, invasive candidiasis, when there are risk factors without any clinical signs and symptoms. Basically, it is a fear-driven approach. Next, the preemptive, or sorry, next is the empirical treatment. So, when there are risk factors present, but there is no other uh, risk factors and fever is present, but there is no and there are no other causes of fever which is there and um, you don't have any serological marker or culture which is uh, which is there so this is a fever driven approach next is a preemptive uh, approach where there is uh, the patient is not symptomatic but there is a diagnostic test which is positive which could be your culture or biomarker and this is a evidence driven approach last is your targeted treatment once you are uh, isolating an organism, uh, isolating candida, that is your, uh, you are going to 
use the targeted approach so depending upon the various uh, situation you're going to treat given prophylactic or empiric or preemptive so what are the things you're going to use in case of targeted treatment as i mentioned before the drug of choice is uh, i i cannot kind of that is a casper fungi in case of catheter related remove the catheter that is the first and foremost recommendation second thing uh, in case of prophylactic so where are you going to give prophylactic so based on the scoring system as i mentioned uh, you can use fluconazole uh, in cases of uh, icu where there are high, high risk so fluconazole can be used as a prophylactic treatment in cases of empirical that is when the patient is there is a fever driven approach and uh, that is patient is febrile or at risk of infection with no microbiological evidence uh, you can use the acanocandin or fluconazole uh, in case of a preemptive when there is a positive microbiological evidence that is um, you are strong uh, positive culture or positive beta d gluten that is your uh, you can use acanocandin or fluconazole so that brings to the end of the discussion on uh, invasive candidiasis uh, so here i have few questions so basically this is a contest which i wanted to announce so this uh, these are the questions related to various webinars as well as the various burst your myths series which i have done so i'll be uh, linking the google form below in the description so you can use uh, to answer these questions and uh, the criteria for uh, being as, uh, accepted for this contest is you should be a subscriber and all your answers should be correct obviously and you should follow my fb group and fill the answer within um, 24 hours that is it will be open till uh, 13th feb 6:30 pm um and once you have filled the google form leave the comment below in the, under this video i'll be announcing the winners in my next video so that's it thank you